Welcome to the Thomistic Institute podcast. Our mission is to promote the Catholic intellectual tradition in the university, the church, and the wider public square. The lectures on this podcast are organized by university students at Thomistic Institute chapters around the world. To learn more and to attend these events, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. Thank you, everyone, who has come out here tonight. And, and I think my number one challenge this evening is going to be to not pull Nathan's iPhone onto the floor. So if that happens, now at least I like, sort of set the stage for that minor disaster. I mean, it's such a pleasure to be here. As Nathan mentioned, I actually did my undergrad just uh, down the road at Caltech. And uh, even though I originate from Sweden, I must say spending four years in Southern California has made me not very good at dealing with Boston weather. So it's very, this is the right time of year to, to stop by here for sure. So what I want to talk about um, is how we can think about the scientific project and the sort of success of science as a way to gain truths about this world that we live in, how we can put that in conversation in different ways with the Catholic intellectual tradition, with it, our faith uh, tradition. And, but I want to start with why, in some sense, we are so excited about science in our society today, and maybe even maybe puts it a bit on a pedestal, like where it doesn't belong sometimes. I mean, there is sort of a good reason to it. And that is that the scientific method, the scientific project, has been a wonderful thing for humanity. Um, it has helped us to cure the sick, to feed the hungry, to bring people out of poverty. These are all great things. Now, as we all know, there are also some not so great things that it comes out, has come out of the, of the scientific project. But I think in some sense it shows that as you find out more about this material order that we live within, like how you can use that for good in many ways. But the main wonder of science that I want to talk about is not sort of science for the sake of something else, um, but science as a way to gain truth. I mean, this is this, the success of the scientific method in sort of unveiling what kind of world we live in is, has been amazing. And it uh, on all different kinds of scales. If we go out to the grandest scales and think about our universe as a whole, we now know that we live in an expanding and evolving universe that had something like a beginning just from the sort of scientific method alone, the Big Bang Theory. If we zoom in a bit and think about stars and planets, uh, thanks to uh, the scientific method, and as you'll see, I'll take a lot of examples from astronomy for some natural reasons. Um, thanks to the development of astronomical instrumentation and uh, theories of physics and so on, we now know how stars and planets form. We know that the space between the stars, which looks kind of empty to the untrained eye, is actually full of dust and gas, and that this dust and gas can coalesce to first form stars and then from sort of leftover material around the stars and the disk you start forming a planetary system and that this is so efficient that even today in our galaxy we form around seven new stars every year and pretty much all of those stars will have a planetary system around them so every star you look at at night is actually a solar system of its own that also means that we know some of our own origins as a planetary species. So our own planet, the Earth, uh, is obviously a special place. Uh, it is um, not just because it is our home, but in some sense because it is the only home we know of. This is still the only planet where we have seen life. Um, I mean, I'm hoping that we one day will find it somewhere else and happy to go there during the Q&A. But for now, it is the only place where we've had something like the origins of life happened. And that too is something that now the scientific method is trying to address. That I would say is something that's currently under development, but what is clear is that the scientific method has been incredibly good at finding out 
also about ourselves as biological creatures. So one of the things, one of the great discoveries of the past century was that at the heart of life is something like a language, the genetic code, which transmits information from one generation to another and also sort of makes sense of the theory of evolution which had been presented uh, much uh, or like long before that. And one of the things I think is the coolest, uh, maybe because it's the furthest from what I actually work on, is that thanks to the scientific method, we now know a lot of what was going on inside of every single cell in our body, including this little guy, so a motor protein carrying a vesicle from one side to another inside the cell, basically transporting nutrients uh, within the cell. And the fact that this is going on right now, like millions of times in your body, is just amazing. And I think just one of the most beautiful examples that I can think of of just how wonderful science has been at, again, uncovering the truth of the world that we live in, and therefore also about ourselves and our own uh, origins. So what is it that makes um, the scientific method so successful? Primarily at uncovering truth, but um, one of the things that we find especially, like I think I purposely tried to show you things that are beautiful. One of the things that we often find in science is that uncovering truths about the world around us also gives us new way to See, see new things, new beautiful things that we would never have seen if it hadn't been for science. And astronomy is especially um, good at doing that. Uh, one of many uh, things that the James Webb Space Telescope is showing us uh, is just these gorgeous images of how stars and planets come together, including this one here. But what is it that makes, um, makes the scientific method so, so good. Uh, so good at sort of interrogating the world around us. To think about that, uh, I just want to sketch out together what, uh, what's at the core of the scientific method and then sort of dig a little bit deeper of, of whether it's actually as simple as this. So if you think back at sort of high school or maybe an introductory college course where the scientific method was presented to you, it was probably something like this. So what you need to start with is some sort of question about the world around you. I'm an astronomer, so I'll pick an ast astronomical example. Focus on the sun. Why does the sun shine? That is a question that I think has come probably naturally to many of you. You might not even remember when you first asked that kind of, kind of question. So if we have a question, what powers the sun? Then the next step is to actually try to find out as much as possible uh, about your object before you start to sort of do your own, uh, your own science. So in this case, maybe you'll try to actually figure out, well, how much does the sun shine? Like to measure how much energy is emanating from it. Once you have tried, gathered as many facts as you can, uh, the next step is now to come up with an idea or a hypothesis of what is going on. If we were sitting in the 19th century or maybe even, uh, maybe even now, you think about what does the sun look like? Well, it kind of looks like a fiery ball. I mean, that is, that is kind of what it looks like. And what is the fire here on Earth? Well, the fire here on, on Earth is a conversion, like a release of chemical energy. You're burning a candle. You're turning wax, beeswax maybe, into uh, CO2. So if we have, uh, so we, we can have this other hypothesis that maybe that's what's going on in the sun as well. You're releasing chemical energy. And then you need to come up with a way to test whether that hypothesis is true or not. And one way to do it is to see, well, assume that the whole sun is full of molecules and we take all that energy from all those molecules and we can compare that with the output from the sun, which we had already figured out how to measure some way. And then we can compare the two. And if you do that and you take, uh, you assume there's chemical energy, you see how long could the sun burn for with its current output, 
you get something like 100,000 years. So the sun would run out of energy in about 100,000 years if it was chemical energy. Now, that might have been fine a few hundred years ago when we didn't, have, we didn't know how old the Earth was. But once geology kicked in in sort of the 17th, 18th, 19th century, this became like less and less uh, tenable. And we needed a new hypothesis of what powers the sun. And as uh, probably most of you know, uh, the new hypothesis that uh, people came up with is there's not chemical energy, but it's the energy that's stored in sort of the nuclei of atoms that we can release if we get to high enough temperatures in the sun. And now if you compare sort of how much energy that's stored in the sun and with the current energy output, you get that the sun could last for 10 billion years. Uh, this is very good news because we are currently about halfway there, which means that we have quite a few billion years uh, left. Really though, we only have about one billion because then it will get too hot, like the sun actually gets um, more and more luminous over time, but that's still a good, good number of years uh, to have in our future. So this, this is... Uh, how science work at its core with some important caveats. But if we think about what makes this so powerful, well, there's at least a couple of things that we can immediately uh, pull out. One is that it actually has, in some sense, a rather narrow and humble scope. Uh, you have, when you take this method, you try to isolate specific sort of physical and chemical feature of the word, you're claiming that you can ignore a lot of things and this is still going to work. And that turns out to be, very, to be very powerful. The other thing is that this is almost like a dialogue going on between the scientist and the world around you, where you constantly get your reality checks on whether you're on the right, right path or not. So, so these are things that makes, uh, that explain at least some of this sort of explosion of knowledge that we have seen in the past few hundred years. In reality though, like this, it is not, it's a little bit more complicated than this sort of circle of, of science um, might suggest. I mean, one of the things that is very mysterious about it to start with is where did those questions come from? Why do some people have them and others do not? I mean, people often talk about inspiration, which is some of this in-spiritness. I mean, it's like it's a strange thing that it often feels like it's coming from the outside rather than coming from the inside. So that, that's a sort of a mysterious thing in its own right. But in sort of the bigger picture, what I think we have to recognize is that it's not, most of the time, it's not as easy as with the example I just presented to you to tell whether you have enough evidence to go one way uh, or the other. Uh, I think historically, one of the most obvious uh, places we can go to sort of look at this a bit more, a bit more detail uh, is to astronomy. One of the most famous sort of conflicts between science and religion has to do with a change uh, from accepting an Earth-centric cosmology to one that's heliocentric. So it happened so sort of late 15th, uh, first half of the 16th, uh, cent or like sorry, 16th century into the 17th century. So what we had happening in this sort of early modern time is that astronomical observations were getting better. Even before Galileo, uh, we had Tycho Brahe in Denmark. He was doing very careful by eye observations. And there was, and then Galileo brought in the telescope and there were sort of more and more things that didn't really fit very well with an Earth-centric cosmology. But they weren't such a poor fit that it could completely disprove it. So you have that on the one hand. Then you have Copernicus who comes up with the idea that, well, what happens if we instead assume that the sun is at the center with the Earth orbiting it? And it turns out, maybe not surprising, this is we know that this is, the, this is the truth, that you can set up a much simpler model to explain the astronomical data uh, if you assume the sun is at the center and the Earth is orbiting around it. And scientists, I think people in general, tend to favor simple ideas rather than complex ones if they can explain the same thing. So that's something really going in its favor. 
once Kepler figures out that these orbits are not circles by, but elliptical, you start now get, to get better fits uh, for, the, uh, for the heliocentric model compared to the Earth-centric one. But how much evidence do you need to switch from one model uh, to the other? I mean, that is not all, that's something that might be obvious in hindsight. It was not obvious at the time. It was especially not obvious because on the one hand, you had two mathematical models, one that was starting to fit a bit better, but you also have wanted to understand why do you have this kind of system? With the Earth-centric, the Aristotelian cosmology, there was a clear physical explanation why the Earth is at the center. It's heavy, heavy things fall to the center. Um, what keeps the Earth and other planets suspended? Like, why do they orbit the sun? It wasn't until Newton and his uh, theory of universal gravity that we actually had a new physics to also explain why in some sense the math uh, worked out. So it is, um, though it's often presented as a conflict, conflict between science and religion, I think it's much better presented as um, a big sort of break between the classical Aristotelian cosmology and the new heliocentric cosmology that was emerging as we were getting better, better data. And part of what should be good evidence for that is that every person involved was deeply religious. This was not a sort of science versus religion. This was happening within the Catholic Church for Galileo uh, and then within the Protestant word for, for, Kepler and Galileo, uh, for Kepler and Newton. You can see this in their own writings. But still, what happened was that we went from having what uh, was seen as a, as a cosmology that fitted well with a sort of religious worldview, where the earth, which is central to the creation story of Genesis, was at the center, um, where things seemed to some sense to be somewhat human scale, uh, and where you had a sense of sort of clear order, hierarchy, structure, like a clear difference between sort of earth down here and the heavens above, to a new world order or new cosmology where things seem to just run really well on their own. As uh, sort of clockwork uh, kind of universe is something that you start hearing around this time. So if you have something that's running that well on its own, where does God fit in? I mean, that is something when we think about sort of how modernity starts threatening the supremacy of religion as sort of an explanation. That's where people, like the sort of the clockwork universe, and it seems like if you just know the laws of nature, that's all you need to explain what you see in the, in the world around you. So we have sort of a historical arc that seems to go from being earth-centric and God-centric to moving the earth sort of out of the center, but also these laws of nature sort of taking over from the traditional sort of religious narratives. And this is something that you hear pretty often that then it just gets worse and worse and worse, right? We get to a point where we, we don't just uh, have the sun being more important than the earth, but then the sun is just a star in, one, in a galaxy and then there are so many galaxies and we just get smaller and smaller and smaller. And it all seems like how could something like the biblical narrative where you have God, the creator of all of this, intensely caring about this race and this earth just starts to seem maybe less plausible. But then you have one of these like strange twists in the history of science, which is that just as the telescopes get good enough to study in detail these external galaxies, those galaxies do not look the way that you would expect. Instead, what you see is that they, um, they have the wrong color. The further away these galaxies are, the redder they are. And the simplest explanation for what's going on there is that the further away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away. This was something that uh, Hubble uh, discovered in the, in the sort of first half of the 20th century. But it took a different man uh, named uh, Father Lemaitre to come up with the idea like what these observations meant. 
which is that we live in a, u in, a, in a universe that is expanding. And if something is expanding and you sort of roll back time, then you come to a beginning of the expansion to the Big Bang. Um, the reason that Lemaitre was the one who came up with this idea rather than Hubble, I think is one of these you know, this mysterious things. I mean, I've already sort of primed you that this, why do some people ask those kind of questions? Because once you ask the question, it wasn't something that's only a matter of time until it was going to be uh, eventually an accepted scientific idea. Well, I think there is, an, on the one hand, there is sort of a very sort of naturalistic uh, explanation. Lemaitre was one of very few people at the time who both understood astronomy. He was at Harvard and MIT when these discoveries were being made in the US. And he understood the new physics, Einstein's theory of relativity, which sort of naturally lends itself to an unstable uh, universe as either expanding or contracting. So on the one hand, it was sort of the right person at the right place to be able to put those things together. Uh, by contrast, Hubble actually never believed in the Big Bang. Uh, Hubble died thinking there was no Big Bang theory. Uh, but I think there's also, I think we're allowed to speculate how your worldview uh, makes you receptible to those ideas when they arise in your mind. Just as if we sort of go back in time to the 16th and 17th century and the opposition that sort of the new scientists were getting as they were presenting the heliocentric model to the largest large sort of Aristotelian cosmologist, um, we have in the early 20th century, people really set on the cosmos being stable, on being infinite both in time and in space. And that's sort of part of the clockwork kind of universe idea. But you have someone like Lemaitre who, even though he was very careful in separating his religious pursuits and his scientific ones, who I think must have had an openness to that there is a beginning to the universe. That to him, it was not this scary idea that you have a universe that changes over time that goes back to a single point of origin. So if you want to think about, again, sort of possible conflicts between science and religion, I think we should um, not only have I not seen any real conflict ever existing, and again, happy to dig into some proposed ones at the, at the Q&A. But if we truly believe that there is, um, that the truths that are revealed by science and the truths that are revealed by revelation have the same source, uh, we, should, uh, we should expect actually something that is more than not a conflict, that having that openness uh, to the truth of revelation should also uh, give you a bit more openness to finding the right truths uh, scientifically. So the scientific project has been, as I said, extremely successful. Um, it is something that's often today uh, seen as um, the one method to find truths about the, the word. And all other sort of ways of getting knowledge is in some way compared to the, to the scientific uh, method. Now, I am convinced um, that the scientific method is a great good, as I said, that have done, that continues to be an incredibly effective tool to unlocking truths in the universe. Uh, but I also think it's important to uh, keep in mind that it is not the one and only sort of universal path towards knowledge. There are many limitations to the scientific method, and in some sense, the limitations is actually its strengths. But some of these limitations have to do with what kind of questions we're asking and what we actually want to know about. There are many kinds of questions where there's no scientific answer. I chose the Pieta to as an example of if you want to understand what the Pieta is doing, why it's hopefully touching you, why you find it beautiful, the scientific method is not the right place to go. If you're trying to figure out if something is moral or not, 
the scientific method is not going to give it the right answer. If you're trying to uh, make sort of a policy decision, the scientific method is not the right answer. It doesn't mean science can't inform it. It can, often, and it, it should when it's, when it's appropriate. I mean, if you are trying, if, if you have made, a sort of, for example, sort of a moral decision that it is immoral to cause unnecessary suffering to another human being, then using the scientific method to figure out what causes suffering and what doesn't, that would be a perfectly reasonable, reasonable way to have them feed into one another. But you first have to make that moral decision, what is moral and what is not. So there are many areas uh, of, of knowledge which are not scientific and that can't be reduced to scientific answers. And they're often some of the, like, the most important questions uh, to, to both to ask and to answer uh, in the first place. The scientific method is also not appropriate to answer some of the big sort of philosophical and theological questions. I guess that would be sort of subcategory of the previous one. So questions such as, does God exist? Again, there might, you might be informed by science in trying to to answer them, but ultimately it's not going to be something that the scientific method can answer. And why? <coughs> well, if we hold that God, the God of the Bible, um, is the creator of the whole material order, is existence himself, is completely outside of time and space, well then the methods that have been carefully developed to interrogate the material order within creation, within time and space, there's just no way that they can be used uh, towards um, assessing whether God is real or not. That is not the only thing that cannot be uh, assessed by science. Even some things that might seem like they're part of the material order are not actually appropriate to use scientific tools on. Two, the most important two, one would be the whole material order as a sort of complete uh, creation. Something cannot cause itself. So if we take, if we take that, it ex that the whole material order, maybe it's the universe, maybe it's a bigger structure, what the cause of that cannot be something else material because we, so this is by definition, we have included the whole, everything material in it. The other thing that cannot be um, directly explained by science is if you have from philosophical or theological reasons convinced yourself that human beings are not just material but they are this sort of combination of the material and the spiritual so this, uh, and spiritual, spiritual, spiritual soul material body then the, that soul can also not have a scientific explanation that too must be a direct creation of God. Science is also limited in the sense that it's not something that's freestanding, that's obvious on its own. Uh, the scientific project fundamentally depend on some philosophical and even theological commitments. So when we, like why does the scientific uh, method work so well? Well, it works so well because we live in a universe that has this incredible order to it but not just any kind of order, an order that's intelligible to us. That there's something out there, sort of the, the material word, that actually can be comprehended and corresponds to something in our, our minds. That is not something one can take for granted. Also, to, for, the, for the scientific method to work, there must be some pretty strong correspondence between what the word is, word is actually like and our sense perceptions and processing of that, of that data, which again is not something one can take for granted. And third, if you're going to trust what comes out of the scientific project or the scientific method, you must either explicitly or implicitly assume that our minds can recognize truth, that there is that somehow our minds are ordered towards recognizing the true. 
And that goes beyond just recognizing what is sort of useful for survival and so on. That is, it's not at all obvious that you would think you would get that through Darwinian evolution alone. So all these sort of like, there are all these sort of like hidden sort of structure underneath the scientific uh, project. So these so far are all things that you could bring in revelation if you wanted to, but these will also just be things you could figure out just by bringing in philosophy that there are these limitations to the scientific project. But a final thing that I want to talk about here uh, has to do with something that's very central to Christian theology, which is that of miracles. So there are like, you don't have to have miracles in a religion. Like when we think about miracles, so that we have some direct intervention of God into the material, uh, material word, like causing something to happen that's not caused, that cannot be caused by certain natural causes, or at least not in that instance. You can imagine a religion where that is not that important. But Christianity is not one of those. So, I mean, at the very center of Christianity is the miracle of the resurrection. I mean, that's sort of like sort of central tenet. So, to be a committed Christian and to uh, sort of struggle with a possibility of miracles, there's going to be a real, real tension there. There is, um, there have been multiple sort of claims on that the scientific project is fundamentally at odds with the existence of miracles. So that could be, you know, a whole talk on its, on its own. So I'm not going to have any sort of like long discussion or proofs, but I'm going to sketch out sort of three objections and how I would start uh, thinking about them. I don't think they're very strong objections. The first one is that somehow the scientific project has ruled out the possibility of miracles. And I think the way to think about this is that I mean, the this, in some sense, the goal of the scientific project is to uncover these laws of nature that, that govern sort of the overall structure and fate uh, of, of the universe. And that these laws cannot be broken. Um, sometimes there's an analogy drawn with sort of the laws of mathematics or laws of logic that really cannot be broken. And that sort of the laws of science are are the same. So you cannot break the laws of mathematics because that goes against sort of logic. It's like, um, and, the, and the idea is that there's, it's almost it's the same thing to say that uh, you cannot say that two plus two doesn't equals four. And also you cannot say that gravity will like stop being, being present at some moment, that those are the same kind of statements. And they're just, they're not. Uh, logical impossibilities would be impossible in any, any word, right? But you could conceive of a universe where the laws of nature are just acting very differently. In fact, physicists do that all the time. One of the great mysteries is why our universe seems to have the kind of laws of nature that actually makes it conducive to life. That is not something that can all be taken for granted. So to say that you cannot break laws of nature that just doesn't really make sense, at least if you think of it in sort of an absolute way, that there's no way they could be uh, otherwise or be suspended. The second sort of line of objection goes back to people like Hume, who, would, who wouldn't say that 100% certain you can never have uh, miracles, but that it's never reasonable to assume that you have a miracle. So why not? Well, the idea there is something like, well, the stranger something is, the stronger evidence you need for it. And if a miracle is like a one in like a forever kind of event, you kind of need sort of infinite evidence for it. So as an example, let's say that your friend is standing in front of you. She has a broken arm. You pray, and the arm sort of comes back and is healed. Now, if Hume was standing there uh, in front of you, what he would say is that, well, it's more reasonable that I hallucinated that whole event 
because that happens, you know, people do hallucinate, then that, that was an actual miracle because miracles basically never happen in, in Hume's, Hume's word. That is, you can, you can make that commitment, but what I would say is that that is not the scientific commitment, that is the philosophical one where you have sort of somehow predecided the probability on miracles versus non-miraculous explanations. And I'm going to go say one more thing, which I think is not a very reasonable commitment to make to basically be that suspicious of your own sense perceptions that starts actually threatening the whole scientific uh, project. Like you, skepticism is okay, but sort of radical skepticism makes science impossible. The third one, the, the third sort of potential conflict is that it would seem that if you allow for the presence of miracles, you can never really trust your science. Let's take an astronomy uh, example. Let's say that I have you know, carefully calibrated my telescope. I've turned it towards a star that I think might have some planets around it. I'm carefully observing those planets. And then, just as I'm observing them, God just decides to fling in some extra photons into my telescope and trick me into thinking that there's an extra planet there. How can I know that that doesn't happen if I think that miracles are possible? I mean, I don't think you actually, in, if the universe was ruled by sort of a science-hating demon, I don't think you could actually rule that out. I mean, that, that, that's a kind of suspension uh, of sort of laws of nature for just to trick uh, poor scientists. But here's where sort of the theology of miracles I think is very important, that why do miracles happen? That they happen uh, as signs, uh, signs of God's providence, of his love, or of some other of his attributes that he wants to reveal in some special way. I mean, that if you go back and look at the miracles, in the Bible, whether it's those of Jesus or someone else, you'll find that there's, there's always something that God is trying to show with his miracles. They're not sort of random tricking someone event. And I would put to you, it would not be a very good sign of either God's sort of providence or his charity to go and put these sort of random fake planets uh, in my data. So more for theological rather than sort of pure philosophical reasons, I would rule that out. So with that, uh, those sort of like thoughts in our mind, I want to take the last few minutes and just think about how do we, how do we deal with sort of scientific ideas or like claims that science can explain some sort of like big portions of the universe on whether it is reasonable to assume that there's going to be a scientific answer to that or whether it's a miracle. And I'm going to take three, we're going to look at three questions quickly together. Origins of the universe and the Big Bang Theory. Origins of planets, including the solar system. And origins of life. And the question is, was it a miracle? So we have already actually talked a little bit about the origins of the universe a couple of times. And importantly here, the origins of our universe is not the same as the Big Bang theory. So the scientific theory of the Big Bang describes something that's already existing, expanding very rapidly and very forcefully. So if we sort of scroll back time, we come to a universe that's extremely dense and extremely hot and that starts to expand. But something is there when the expansion is starting. So the Big Bang goes back far, but it doesn't go f back to nothing. It goes back to something. And that still leaves the question open of where that something came from. That question has actually always been there or should have been there. Uh, but I think it's easier to forget about it if you think that you live in sort of an infinite, eternal kind of universe. Uh, I think one of the great providential developments is that just as it seemed like this you know, arc of science was just pushing us further and further away from asking these big theological questions, the Big Bang Theory comes along and it's suddenly much more difficult to 
not to ask yourself, where did that come from? But what we already talked about is that that kind of question, where did the whole universe, the whole material order come from, that that is not the scientific question. That is something that science cannot explain how something comes out of nothing. Only God can create something out of nothing. So the Big Bang, at least in some meaning of the word, was definitely a miracle. How about the origins of the solar system? When Newton came up with his uh, theory of universal gravity and applied it to the solar system, uh, one of the things that he thought that God had to do was first of all to create it in the first place. Nothing that beautiful and orderly could come sort of by chance. But then he also actually thought that you probably needed to sort of readjust it fairly regularly so that God needed to take actually a very active uh, part in this. And that has to do with sort of some of the instabilities that you get in the equations when you try to have more than two bodies to interact uh, gravitationally. So Newton would have said, yes, it was a miracle. Actually, there's like multiple miracles that's happening with, with where the solar system came from. Now we have observations of how these solar systems come into existence. Uh, and even though it's not the fully solved problems, we have a pretty good idea of how sort of dust and gas in the interstellar medium through the causal powers of this dust and gas uh, under the laws of gravity can collapse to form these stars. And because there's always a bit of rotation when these stars collapse, you get the disks, you get this nice symmetric uh, kind of disk and then planets form in the disk. And that's why you have the nice almost circular uh, orbits of planets around the star. So we have, so, so I think with confidence we can say this was not a miracle. But that's, you know, in, in hindsight, when we already have figured out some of the science, uh, should Newton have said that already, uh, you know, a few hundred years ago? And the answer is probably yes. Like, even if the science wasn't figured out, there's no sort of logical contradiction like it would be with origins of the universe where you couldn't have a scientific explanation or a naturalistic explanation of the origin of, of planetary systems. And if you, add, if you add some good theology to that, which is that throughout history, God's preferred way of interacting with the word is most of the time through secondary causes. So God is always active. His providential care is always there. He can act directly uh, through miracles, but most of the time he acts through his creation, through people, or through laws of nature, and that that's something that we can just see happening all the time. It's something that theologians have recognized for thousands of years. You can read St. Augustine, for example. So if that is something, if that's sort of God's preferred mode of working, if there's no logical contradiction, we should be looking for a scientific or naturalistic explanation rather than a miraculous one. That brings me to the final uh, one, which is origins of life. So the claim here is that that couldn't happen naturally, and or like by some, I should say, that couldn't happen naturally, and therefore it must be a miracle. So why couldn't it happen naturally? Well, the two claims that are made is that it's mathematically impossible to go from just having atoms of different kinds sort of swirling around and the, and at, the in a, at the, you know, the ocean or lake of a planet, come together and form these incredibly complex kind of cells. It's just mathematically impossible. Uh, I mean, you saw the little guy carrying uh, the vesicle. That seems like having that happen by chance just seems like it just ca can't happen. The second objection is that it can't happen philosophically. Especially if you accept um, the sort of the philosophical understandings of Aristotle, 
living things are fundamentally different from non-living things. So you can't have one just go, you can't have a non-living sort of entity cause life uh, to happen. So these seems like pretty, pretty difficult objections. But the first thing I want to note is that they are still of a very different kind compared to the origin of the universe, where you have a true sort of logical like um, objection that you just something cannot come from nothing. Like God is the only one who can create out of nothing. Here they are more subtle, right? You have this mathematical impossibility. But that really depends on how we think the laws of chemistry work. If yes, if it is truly random how atoms combine, it would be ma mathematically impossible. But it is not random how atoms combine. And in fact, there's been a lot of, I think, good science in the past few years, past decades, showing that it's actually quite easy for, for the natural word for nature to form very complex organic molecules without there being any sort of life forming them. That's true in space, it's true in comets, it's true on planets, it was probably true on the young Earth. So I'm not sure like, that that sort of like mathematical claim that has a lot of things hanging onto it that depends on how you think the chemistry works. Now, if my suspicion is true that actually chemistry uh, can produce something that uh, can, can lead to life, then it's actually really cool because it means that the laws of chemistry are kind of directed towards bringing forth life. And I think that would be just one extra sort of feather in the cap of the God who created a word order where the laws of nature are like incredibly powerful in sort of directing the whole universe towards something like ourselves. The second objection, the philosophical one, I would say that's not raised as much because most people are not Aristotelians. Um, but the Aristotelian philosophy is very important for Catholic theology. So it is like an objection that I think we should take very seriously. Um, I'm not an Aristotelian, Aristotelian philosopher, so I will not at all go into depth here. I will just, just leave you with that both Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas thought that under for some particular, very particular cases, it was actually possible for non-living matter to bring out living things. They thought that certain sort of insects uh, for basically formed out of dung and sunlight. So they, again, these are like special cases, but it's clear they didn't think it was completely impossible uh, to have that kind of transformation uh, happen. And what I want to leave you with is that if it's not impossible, we should be looking for scientific explanations. And we should be doing it both because we have seen this, we have this history of the scientific method being incredibly effective at finding out truths about our origins, but even more so because we have a theological understanding of the word that really, um, reveals to us how much, in some sense, power sharing God is doing, uh, how much is happening through, like how powerful secondary causes are in the universe. And it's important when I say secondary causes, that doesn't mean that the primary cause is gone. God, as the creator of the universe, is the one person that can act completely and we act completely at the same time that can cause completely and we cause completely at the same time. So it's not that he is not part of the creation, it's that he lets us be part of it too. And with us here, I mean, not just us as human beings, but sort of the created order uh, as a whole. And with that, thank you. Thanks for listening to this lecture on the Thomistic Institute podcast. The generosity of people like you makes this podcast possible. If you enjoy these talks, please consider showing your support at www.tomisticinstitute.org slash donate. Your donation of even a dollar helps us reach more college students and many others with the powerful truths of the faith, and it ensures that we can keep publishing top-notch lectures on this podcast. Thanks a lot.